collection of what the Greeks, the Romans, the Hittites, the Hebrews all had to say, and it was in one place. Some of the most terrifying discoveries in the history of humankind were locked in the pages of ancient books and manuscripts, but nothing prepares you for the shocking discovery recently made by scientists about the Bibliothèque of Alexandrie. What have scientists discovered about this ancient library that shocks even the most experienced of them? Stay tuned to this video to find out. When an ancient library is described as the mirror of the world, you would know that it was much more than just a collection of scrolls or books. This almost mythical is so unbelievable that some people find it hard to believe it existed. Diving into the origins of the library plunges us into a whirlpool of history, mystery, and scholarly debate. It was a sprawling complex of learning, thought, and scholarly exchange. Alexandria Library is one of the hallmarks of Egypt's coastal city. Founded in the 3rd century BCE, it has been credited to Ptolemy I Sota, a successor of Alexander the Great and the founder of the Ptolemaic dynasty in Egypt. The Ptolemies were passionate patrons of the arts and sciences, and under their reign, Alexandria became the shining star of knowledge and culture. However, the library's exact origins are shrouded in mystery, with some accounts suggesting that it was Ptolemy II Philadelphus, the son of Ptolemy I, who actually established it. Theories about who built the library are varied and rich. Some suggest that Demetrius of Phaleron, an Athenian politician and a student of Aristotle, was enlisted by Ptolemy the Fern to spearhead the project. Why was the magical library built? For the audacious purpose of housing all human knowledge under one roof. This ambition led to the library's aggressive acquisition strategy, which included buying up scrolls and books from across the known world and even seizing them from ships that docked in Alexandria's bustling port. As for its construction, the library was part of a larger complex known as the Museum of Alexandria, which also included lecture halls, observatories, and living quarters for scholars. You can imagine the setting as a modern university. The library itself was an architectural marvel. Ancient sources claim it held anywhere from 400,000 to 700,000 scrolls, a staggering number that speaks to the breadth and depth of its collection. It was a multi-storied structure with lecture rooms, meeting spaces, and rows upon rows of shelves filled with papyrus scrolls. The library's location within the Royal District of Alexandria, close to the palace, underscored its importance to the Ptolemaic dynasty and its role as a center of Hellenistic culture and scholarship. And citing the library in proximity to the sea facilitated the exchange of ideas as scholars from across the Mediterranean world were drawn to its doors. Descriptions of the library often evoke images of vast halls filled with scholars, the air thick with the scent of papyrus and ink. It was a place where the greatest minds of the ancient world came to learn, teach, and debate like thirsty animals to a watering hole. From mathematics and astronomy to literature and philosophy, the Library of Alexandria represented the pinnacle of ancient knowledge. One of the most notable figures associated with the Bibliothèque of Alexandria was Hypatia of Alexandria. However, she would come to a brutal end. As a mathematician, astronomer, and philosopher, her role in the late period of the Alexandrian Library, often referred to as the daughter of the library, was pivotal. Hypatia of Alexandria was a prominent mathematician, philosopher, and advisor. Hypatia actively contributed to the intellectual life of Alexandria, making significant advancements in mathematics and astronomy, and passionately engaging in philosophical discourse. Hypatia's lectures attracted a diverse audience, from eager young students to seasoned scholars, all drawn by her eloquence, intelligence, 
and the depth of her understanding. She was known to teach the works of Plato and Aristotle, bridging the gap between the classical philosophical traditions and the contemporary thought of her time. Her classroom was a beacon of enlightenment, promoting a rational approach to understanding the universe, free from superstition and dogma. Apart from her teaching, Hypatia made substantial contributions to the field of mathematics, notably in the realm of geometry and algebra. She is credited with the invention of the astrolabe, a device crucial for navigation and understanding the movements of the stars. Her work on conic sections furthered the study of geometric shapes and had implications for the development of more advanced theories centuries later. However, Hypatia's prominence in a male-dominated intellectual world, her political influence, and her adherence to pagan philosophy amidst the rising tide of Christianity made her a figure of controversy. In March of 415 CE, this tension culminated in a tragedy that would echo through the ages. Hypatia became the victim of a brutal murder by a Christian mob, a group incited by rumors and inflamed by religious zealotry. The mob, led by a fervent sect known as the Parabolani, ambushed Hypatia as she traveled through the city. In a gruesome act of violence, they dragged her from her chariot, took her to a church, and there stripped her naked and killed her, using sharp tiles or oyster shells. They then tore her body into pieces and burned the remains, erasing her presence from Alexandria in a barbaric attempt to quell the influence of pagan intellectuals and solidify the rise of Christian orthodoxy. Hypatia's murder marked a turning point in the history of Alexandria and symbolized the decline of the classical pagan world and the ascendancy of Christianity. Her death is often mourned as the end of an era of intellectual freedom and the beginning of a period characterized by religious dogmatism and the suppression of scientific inquiry. Despite the brutal end to her life, Hypatia's legacy endured. She became a symbol of the loss of ancient knowledge and a martyr for the cause of reason and learning. Hypatia's story, a blend of brilliance and tragedy, continues to inspire those who value the pursuit of knowledge over ignorance and tolerance over fanaticism. Her contributions to mathematics, astronomy and philosophy, as well as her role as a female intellectual in a patriarchal society, ensure that her light, though extinguished in violence, still illuminates the path of inquiry and the quest for understanding. What magical content was contained in the belly of this mystical library? Well, imagine that you are walking through its vast halls, surrounded by works that would shape the course of history. The content of this magnificent library was as diverse as it was profound, covering every conceivable subject, from the arts and sciences to philosophy and medicine. Sadly, some of them are lost forever to humankind. Imagine the lost works of great minds like Pythagoras, Hipparchus, and Apollonius of Perga, nestled in the nooks of the great library. Pythagoras, with his profound connection to numbers and the cosmos, left behind treatises exploring the very music of the spheres, a harmonious celestial symphony that binds the universe. Within these unseen scrolls, could Pythagoras have hinted at the existence of parallel universes, realms where his mathematical theorems took on new, unimaginable dimensions? Hipparchus, the father of trigonometry, probably charted stars and constellations in manuscripts of unparalleled accuracy, perhaps even glimpsing the procession of the equinoxes or the wobble of Earth's axis. His lost works could have contained early theories on the movement of celestial bodies, predating modern astronomy by millennia. And what of Apollonius of Perga, the great geometer? His treatises on conic sections could have laid the groundwork 
for understanding the elliptical orbits of planets, a concept not realized until Kepler's time. Did Apollonius unlock secrets of the cosmos that would remain hidden until the age of telescopes? Among the scrolls were volumes dedicated to astral alchemy, an ancient practice where the cosmos played a critical role in the transmutation of elements. These texts might have detailed moments of cosmic conjunctions where planets aligned in such a way that lead could be turned into gold, or so the alchemists whispered among themselves. The secrets of these celestial events, their power harnessed through esoteric rituals lost to time, could have revealed a universe more interconnected and magical than previously imagined. Hidden within the depths of the library, there might have been scrolls containing the ultimate equation, a cosmic code capable of unifying the forces of gravity and light. This holy grail of physics, sought after by modern scientists in the form of a theory of everything, could have been inscribed on papyrus, its secrets waiting to unlock the mysteries of the universe. Did the ancients come close to understanding the fabric of reality, encoding their knowledge in symbols and equations that pointed to a unified cosmic truth? Perhaps the most intriguing content was scrolls dedicated to the concept of time travel. Eratosthenes, known for calculating the Earth's circumference with astonishing accuracy, might have delved into the theoretical existence of wormholes, passages through space-time that could bend the fabric of reality itself. And Archimedes, with his genius for invention and understanding of optics, could have theorized about bending time with mirrors, a concept that straddles the line between science and magic. These ancient scholars, with their unparalleled intellects and boundless curiosity, might have penned treatises on manipulating time and space, exploring the potential of time capsules that could one day be cracked open by future generations. Their scrolls, lost to history, hold the promise of insights into time travel, a concept that continues to fascinate and perplex modern science. At the heart of this intellectual paradise, known as the Bibliothèque of Alexandrie, were the works of Aristotle, the polymath whose writings covered a breathtaking array of subjects, from logic and metaphysics to ethics, politics and biology. Aristotle's contributions to the library were monumental, offering future generations a comprehensive system of Western philosophy and science. His texts on biology, in which he meticulously described various forms of life, dissecting and classifying them, were revolutionary. These works laid the foundational, stones for the scientific method, and are speculated to have influenced countless scholars who frequented the library. Then there was Euclid, the father of geometry, whose seminal work, Elements, was a centerpiece of the library's mathematical collection. Elements was not just a textbook of geometry, it was an unparalleled synthesis of the mathematical knowledge of the time organized into a logical framework that has influenced mathematics to this day, the library's patrons would have pored over its propositions and proofs, engaging in spirited debates in the shadowed alcoves of the library. Archimedes, another luminary whose works graced the shelves of the library, was a genius of engineering and mathematics. His treatises on the lever, pulleys and buoyancy were groundbreaking. The library housed his work on spirals, the approximation of the world-famous Pi and the principle of the lever. Archimedes's theories and inventions, documented in the scrolls of the library, represented some of the most advanced technological and mathematical thought of antiquity. Beyond these giants of the ancient world, the library was a beacon for scholars, poets, and scientists. The works of Hippocrates, the father of medicine, with his empirical approach to healing and disease, would have been a cornerstone of the library's medical texts. His Hippocratic Oath, 
a seminal document in the history of medical ethics, might have been studied and sworn by ancient physicians in Alexandria. The library also contained early works on astronomy and geography. Eratosthenes, the chief librarian at one point, made extraordinary contributions, including calculating the Earth's circumference with remarkable accuracy and devising the concept of latitude and longitude. His works, stored within the library, would have been invaluable to scholars and explorers of the time. In the realm of literature and drama, the library was unmatched. It housed the works of Homer, Sophocles, Euripides, and other titans of Greek literature, preserving the epic tales and tragedies that are still performed today. The library's collection of these texts ensured that the poetic and dramatic heritage of Greece continued to inspire and educate generations. The library was not just about preserving existing knowledge, it was a catalyst for new discoveries and ideas. It speculated that within its walls, scholars developed the precursor theories to modern concepts that still affect our lives. One of such theories is atomism. The theory of atomism, a cornerstone concept in the annals of science, actually traces its origins back to ancient Greece, where it first emerged as a bold philosophical proposition pioneered by Leucippus and his more famous student, Democritus, around the 5th century BCE, atomism introduced an idea that was revolutionary. The universe and all matter within it is composed of tiny, indivisible particles called atoms. This theory was a staggering leap in thought, suggesting that everything from the stars in the sky to the sand beneath our feet was made up of these atoms moving through the void. Democritus, with his assertion that atoms were uncuttable, from the Greek atomos, atomos, meaning indivisible, laid down the first conceptual bricks of what would become modern atomic theory. He envisioned atoms as varying in shape and size, influencing the properties of the matter they composed. This early atomism was not just a scientific theory, but a philosophical stance, asserting a naturalistic explanation of the world that moved away from mythological interpretations. Fast forward to the 19th century, and the ancient theory of atomism begins to find its footing in empirical science. John Dalton, building on the work of earlier chemists, proposed a modern atomic theory in the early 1800s, transforming atomism from philosophical speculation to scientific principle. The 20th century saw atomism evolve further with the advent of quantum mechanics and the discovery of subatomic structures like protons, neutrons, and electrons, revealing that atoms were not, in fact, indivisible. The work of scientists like Ernest Rutherford and Niels Bohr, and later the development of quantum theory by Max Planck, Albert Einstein, and others peeled back the layers of the atom, showing a complex inner world of particles and forces. Beyond chemistry and physics, the implications of atomism extend into cosmology, where the theories about the origins of the universe, such as the Big Bang theory, rest on the foundational understanding of atomic and subatomic particles. It has also influenced biology, where the molecular basis of life is understood through the interactions of atoms in DNA and proteins. Another theory that comes from the Bibliothèque of Alexandria and still shaping modern science is the heliocentric model of the solar system, which posits that the Earth and other planets orbit the Sun. It is a monumental leap in our understanding of the cosmos. This theory, which ignited a revolution in astronomy and physics, traces its origins to ancient Greece with the early seeds of this idea, perhaps being sown within the hallowed halls of the Library of Alexandria. The Alexandrian Library, as the epicenter of knowledge and scholarship in the ancient world, played a pivotal role in the development of astronomical thought. Among the scrolls and scholars, the works of Aristarchus of Samos, an astronomer and mathematician 
who lived in the 3rd century BCE, proposed a model that challenged the geocentric views of the universe that had dominated Greek astronomy. Aristarchus's heliocentric theory, suggesting that the Sun, not the Earth, was at the center of the universe and that the Earth revolved around it, was revolutionary. Though his ideas did not gain widespread acceptance at the time, overshadowed by the geocentric models of Aristotle and Ptolemy, the Library of Alexandria served as a repository for these radical thoughts, preserving them for future generations. The intellectual environment of the Library of Alexandria, fostering open inquiry and debate, was crucial for the development and preservation of such groundbreaking ideas. While the library itself did not survive through the ages, the spirit of inquiry it embodied lived on, inspiring the Renaissance scholars who would later revisit and champion the heliocentric model. Nicholas Copernicus, in the 16th century, famously revisited the heliocentric theory, publishing De Revolutionibus Orbium Coelestium, or On the Revolutions of the Celestial Spheres. It laid the groundwork for modern astronomy. Copernicus's work, challenging centuries of geocentric dogma, can be seen as a direct intellectual descendant of the ideas preserved and nurtured in the Library of Alexandria. The heliocentric model set the stage for the scientific revolution of the 17th century, with figures like Johannes Kepler and Galileo Galilei building upon Copernicus's foundations. Kepler's laws of planetary motion and Galileo's telescopic observations of the moons of Jupiter provided empirical evidence supporting the heliocentric model, further eroding the geocentric paradigm. The development of the heliocentric model also paved the way for Isaac Newton's law of universal gravitation, which offered a mathematical explanation for planetary orbits, confirming the Sun's central role in the solar system's dynamics. This understanding of gravitational forces was a cornerstone in the development of classical mechanics, shaping the scientific landscape for centuries to come. In the modern era, the heliocentric model has led to astonishing discoveries in astrophysics and cosmology. The exploration of our solar system through space missions, the study of other stars and their planetary systems and the understanding of the universe's large-scale structure all stem from the fundamental shift in perspective that the heliocentric model represented. Another staple of modern education that can trace its roots back to the mystical bibliotheque of Alexandria is calculus. Calculus is the mathematical study of continuous change and is a pillar upon which much of modern science and engineering stands. This field has origins that stretch back centuries, intertwining with the legacy of the ancient library of Alexandria. Although calculus, as we know it was formally developed in the 17th century by Sir Isaac Newton and Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, its conceptual roots can be traced to the mathematical and philosophical inquiries preserved and encouraged in the intellectual haven of Alexandria. Euclid's Elements, as mentioned earlier, became a cornerstone of mathematical thought, influencing countless generations of mathematicians. Though Euclid himself did not develop calculus, his methodical approach to geometry and rigorous use of proofs set a standard for mathematical reasoning that would eventually lead to the development of calculus. Archimedes, perhaps the greatest mathematician of antiquity, and whose works were also preserved in the Library of Alexandria, made contributions that are directly linked to the foundations of calculus. Through his method of exhaustion, he was able to calculate areas and volumes of shapes and solids, approaching the concept of the limit, a fundamental idea in calculus. Archimedes's work on spirals, parabolas, and the approximation of P showcased the use of infinitesimals, hinting at the differential calculus developed millennia later. The atmosphere of scholarly pursuit in the Library of Alexandria allowed these early mathematical concepts to be recorded 
studied, and expanded upon. The preservation and dissemination of mathematical knowledge there provided a crucial link in the chain of intellectual history. The mathematicians of Alexandria pushed the boundaries of their field, setting the stage for the later breakthroughs that would culminate in the formalization of calculus. The direct development of calculus had to wait until the scientific revolution of the 17th century, when Newton and Leibniz independently built upon the ancient foundations to create a powerful mathematical tool for describing the natural world. Newton's fluxions and Leibniz's differential calculus offered new ways to tackle problems of motion, growth and change, revolutionizing physics, astronomy and engineering. Whatever happened to the Bibliothèque of Alexandria? The demise of the Library of Alexandria is wrapped in mystery, intrigue and speculation. Theories about its destruction span centuries and involve a cast of historical figures from Julius Caesar to early Christian leaders and Muslim caliphs. Each theory provides a glimpse into the turbulent times that the library existed through and the changing tides of history that ultimately led to its demise. The Julius Caesar theory concerning the demise of the Library of Alexandria is steeped in the dramatic history of ancient conflicts and the pivotal role played by one of Rome's most legendary figures. In 48 BCE, amidst the turmoil of a civil war, Caesar found himself embroiled in the Siege of Alexandria, a critical episode in his campaign to establish dominion over the Roman world. According to historical accounts, in a strategic move to thwart the advance of his rivals and maintain his grip on the city, Caesar ordered his troops to set fire to his own ships docked in Alexandria's harbor. The consequences of this act of war were far-reaching. The flames, born from a military tactic, are said to have spread beyond the confines of the docks, engulfing parts of the city in a devastating inferno. Among the casualties of this conflagration was purportedly the Library of Alexandria. Scholars debate the extent of the damage, with some suggesting that the library suffered significant losses, while others argue that only a portion of its invaluable collection was affected. This incident is often cited as a turning point in the library's history, marking the beginning of its decline. However, the library continued to exist after Caesar's time, suggesting that if it was indeed damaged in the fire, it was not completely destroyed. Another theory points to the rise of Christianity and the subsequent decline of pagan institutions in Alexandria. In the 4th century CE, tensions between Christians and pagans flared, leading to acts of violence and the destruction of pagan temples. The Serapeum, a temple complex that also housed part of the library's collection, was destroyed in 391 CE under the orders of Theophilus, the Patriarch of Alexandria, following an edict by Emperor Theodosius I to dismantle pagan temples. While the Serapeum's destruction is well documented, its impact on the library's holdings remains a matter of speculation. Some historians suggest that this event marked the beginning of the end for the Library of Alexandria, as the loss of the Serapeum significantly diminished its resources and influence. A later theory involves the Muslim conquest of Alexandria in 642 CE. According to a story that emerged centuries after the fact, Caliph Omar ordered the destruction of the library, stating that its texts were either redundant to the Quran and thus unnecessary or contradictory to it and therefore heretical. The story goes that the library's scrolls were used to fuel the city's bathhouses for six months. However, most modern scholars dismiss this tale as apocryphal, noting the lack of contemporary accounts supporting such an event and arguing that the library had likely ceased to exist in its renowned form long before the arrival of Muslim forces. 
Perhaps the most plausible explanation for the library's end is not a single dramatic event, but a prolonged period of decline. Alexandria faced numerous challenges over the centuries, including political upheaval, economic decline, and shifts in the centers of learning and power away from Alexandria to cities like Constantinople and Rome. Additionally, the changing landscape of scholarship with the rise of Christianity and the decline of Hellenistic paganism may have led to decreased support for the institution. This theory suggests that the library gradually lost its patronage, its scholars and its relevance, eventually fading into obscurity and leaving behind little physical evidence of its existence. Closely related to the gradual decline theory is the notion that the spirit of inquiry and intellectual freedom that defined the Library of Alexandria dimmed over the centuries. As the Roman Empire became increasingly Christianized, the tolerance for pagan knowledge and philosophical inquiry that characterized the library's heyday waned. The destruction of texts considered pagan or heretical by Christian authorities may have contributed to the loss of the library's vast collection, even if its physical structure remained. 